Hello, and welcome to the Objective Health Show. I am your host today, Erica, and joining me in the studio is Tiffany and Doug. Hello. Hello. So today we're going to delve into the world of alcohol. And alcoholism. Yeah. And alcoholism and treatment and binge drinking and all sorts of interesting in- information. And we decided to do a show on this topic because it's a part of our everyday life. It's legal, <laughs> it's encouraged, and it has a very interesting history. So maybe starting with the history is best. So we've had a love affair with alcohol for over 9,000 years, according mm-hmm. to research. And it is one of the most universally produced and enjoyed substances uh, in prehistory, too. So people were imbibing alcohol long before writing was even invented. (laughs) Wow. So all over the world, alcohol was being created and produced from all kinds of crops. Um, And the mind-altering property of booze has fired our creativity and our downfall. (laughs) Maybe that invented writing. Yes. (laughs) Fostering the development of language or not, (laughs) inebriation, and um, arts and religion. So basically, you know, drinking is an integral part of our past, right? And some would even say our humanity. Um, Patrick McGovern, a researcher, uh, was recently called uh, the human species homo imbibens, meaning (laughs) we've been imbibing for a long time. So um, from a modern point of view, you know, how did we get to this point? To go back just a little bit uh, about the history, wine was being created, you know, 9,000 years ago um, in the Caucasus Mountains or modern day Georgia. And in Iran, uh, that's one of the first crops that was domesticated to be made into alcohol. Um, There's also compelling information about using different honeys um, in Egypt to make mead and uh, what else? Um, Grains. So uh, yeast and, uh, you know, so pretty much anything. And part of why alcohol was so popular back in the day was that it was safer to drink than water because Mm. of sanitation and, um, what would eventually be pasteurization. It was, you would get more quote unquote nutrients from homemade alcohol than you would from water. And um, so over the millennial, nearly every plant uh, with some sort of sugar or starch has been pressed into the service of fermentation and uh, yeast Uh, produce ethanol as a form of chemical warfare. So it's toxic to other microbes that compete for the sugar inside of fruit. Mm -hmm. Think about that when you think about imbibing alcohol now. (laughs) And uh, there's antimicrobial benefits for the drinker, right? So it uh, explains why beer and wine and other fermented beverages were often so much healthier to drink. So what do you all think? You think it's it's a good thing? <laughs> oh, God. It's just, it's such a nuanced topic to just say whether it's good or it's bad is is tricky. But I have to say that I'm surprised that we ever invented uh, writing if uh, we were drunk all the time. <laughs> kind of seems like it's you not conducive. Thing while you were drunk, I guess. <laughs> and then you wanted to record those songs and pass them. <laughs> That could be it. <laughs> but I guess, maybe the, like, how do we discover that rotten fruit could make you drunk? I guess you, somebody just happened upon, like, an apple tree and there was rotten apples on the ground and they ate some. and Or maybe they noticed that the animals started acting funny if they ate some rotten fruit. Yeah, it could be. Or it was just like, maybe it was like a starvation thing. It's like they gathered up all the the apples and put them in a pile. And then the pile started mm-hmm. to get rotten and stinky and they were hungry. 
So they're like, well, I'm still going to eat this. I don't care. And then they get all drunk and they're like, wow, this is great. (laughs) Well, there's all kinds of nutrients in it, right? B vitamins, folic acid, niacin, thiamine, riboflavin, you know? So um, in the Near East, beer was uh, considered a liquid bread. So it was good for calories Mm. and hydration. (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's kind of funny, though, that it, it there's such contradictory information out there. I mean, it's not surprising, really, given the nature of kind of the media scape that we live in right now, that it's like one day you've got a, a study coming out that says, oh, yeah, um, drinking moderately, it's always moderately, will cure, you know, every disease known to man. But then another study will come out saying, no, even a little bit of alcohol is going to, like, kill you. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like you don't really know where to stand on alcohol. I mean, it's obvious that it has some negative effect. I mean, Erica, before the show, you were basically saying when you drink, you you can't help but feel like you're being poisoned in some way. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's kind of true. It's It's like, you know, despite the fact that you do get this kind of elated feeling and you know it can help uh lubricate the conversation a little bit more and you know before you get to the point where you're acting like a complete ass you know there 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 is some kind of like good feeling from it it's like oh i actually i feel pretty good right now but nonetheless even with that it's kind of like no if i wait a little bit longer i start to get a headache and my mouth gets dry and i don't sleep so good and it you know the next day i feel really terrible and stuff so it's kind of like you you can't help but notice that there's definitely a negative effect. Like even, uh, even with moderate drinking, you can, I I mean, when I was a teenager, it's like, it didn't, I didn't notice anything. You know, I could get drunk, wake up the next day, go to work. I was fine. But as I got older, it was kind of like, Oh, I can't really do this anymore. It's, uh, Mm -hmm. and even like, you know, just having, you know, a glass of wine or something like that. Um, not always, but sometimes it's like the next day it's like, no, this is, this is clearly not, um, good for me well i've never noticed much of a good feeling at all or a feeling of being socially lubricated i just always hated the taste i mean some taste better than other like if they're those fruity little generic wine coolers everybody makes fun of those can be somewhat tasty but as far as the feeling of uh, being tipsy or I don't find what the big deal is and definitely not being drunk and even just having like maybe one or two drinks. I always feel it the next day. Like Mm. I don't feel as mentally sharp. I'm kind of tired and that's not even from drinking that much. Yeah. Well, it's interesting how it used to be called spirits, right? And so having a a spirit or in, in vibing for medicinal purposes. Like, uh, I don't know when you guys were young, but if you had a toothache, you know, maybe your mom rubbed some rum on your gums or a little hot toddy if you were coming down with a cold, you know, so, so. My mother never did. (laughs) No, mine either. Mine either. My mother was a teetotaler, so she would never feed us booze when we were kids. (laughs) So I'll just disclose, I came from a family of serious boozers. So maybe that's why. <laughs> At five, I have a bellyache. Oh, have some vodka. It will help. <laughs> but then, you know, you have the temperance movement that um, started happening in the United States uh, in the 1920s, where it was basically prohibited, right? You couldn't manufacture, sale, or import or export intoxicating liquors. Did that really stop it? No. You can watch endless movies about the failure of prohibition, right? And so, and, and the illegal trade of alcohol boomed. And by 1933, you know, interesting, right around the Depression, they lifted the ban on alcohol. Right. So. <laughs> it's kind of funny that we're so drawn to it as well, given like what I was saying before about it being like, you know, clearly, clearly it's toxic. Like, you, you know that it's not good for you. Yet, as a race, we're completely drawn to it. And we, we just mm-hmm. like, you know, the, the, 
the fact that there was prohibition and people were finding ways. It's like people didn't just go, well, it's illegal now, so I guess I'm not going to drink anymore. It's like, no, they found these unbelievably creative ways to uh, keep on drinking. So it's like there's this, yeah. this very strong draw to alcohol. I mean, I think it's stronger in some people than it is to, to in others. I mean, obviously. I mean, some people don't care for it at all. But um, well, is it the fact that it's alcohol or the fact that it's uh, a mind altering substance, I, I think that perhaps human beings are hardwired to want to free step up. outside of themselves <laughs> mm-hmm. on occasion. <clears throat> so yeah. maybe it's not just alcohol, but my question has always been like, why is alcohol so accepted? when other drugs like marijuana or say mushrooms are not, I mean, I got to understand like uh, smoking crack or shooting up heroin is pretty bad too. (laughs) Alcohol is pretty bad too. And it's no big deal. I mean, you rarely see people smoking on TV or in movies anymore these days, but it's nothing to see somebody just having a drink. Mm-hmm. Like people are supposed to have a drink to relax or it's no big deal if people go out to a bar or something after work and have a drink. It's not frowned upon. It's just a normal part of everyday life. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of crazy. I don't know why, especially considering that alcohol can kind of mess up your life like a lot worse than a lot of those other drugs can. Like I've known some potheads and yeah, you know, there, there's not a lot of positive things to say about that necessarily, but, uh, but compared to like an alcoholic, it's like they're, they're, they're not generally, it's not, it's not in the same league, you know, alcoholic, you know, they have like wrecking their health or wrecking the lives of their family members. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, the fact that the destructive um, uh, effect that alcoholism has on not only the individual's life, but all the lives around them, it's it's really, really messed up Um, as opposed to like, you know, potheads or somebody who's into psychedelics or something like that. I mean, like you were saying, crack, heroin, like obviously those are those are different again, although there is some research out there that actually says that uh, alcoholism is, is worse than those ones. That that mm-hmm. it's it, that's tricky because you know that could just be because of the legality of it and and that sort of thing. Yeah. Like people maybe more, are more likely to go overboard with alcohol than they would be these uh, illegal drugs just because of how easy they are to get the access and things like that. But nonetheless, yeah. it is it is a good question why alcohol has kind of other than prohibition basically maintained this legal status of being okay and being socially acceptable as opposed to other mind altering substances. And really encouraged in a lot of ways. I mean, you can still see ads all the time for whatever type of Jim beam or, you know, uh, I don't know the other types, but <laughs> the, the connoisseurs that follow their favorite brands and have tasting events and, mm really cool advertisements for alcohol. Yeah. <clears throat> and how it kind of permeates our history. Like I remember when I was uh, teaching school and we learned about Johnny Appleseed and everyone thinks that Johnny Appleseed is famous for tra- planting apple trees all across the United States. Well, it turns out that the reason that he was planting those apple trees was to make alcohol. That was really, <laughs> really? it wasn't like this whole earth thing, you know, we're going to plant trees and we're going to make the United States a beautiful place. We're going to make alcohol. <laughs> That's really funny. I never knew that Johnny Appleseed. They leave that, yeah. They leave that out when you learn about Johnny Appleseed, you know, <laughs> That's some of our viewers may not know Johnny Appleseed. That is a distinctly American thing. I didn't know about it until I lived in the U S for a little while. Actually, I was kind of like, who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um yeah, it's interesting, you know. I mean, we were talking about the uh the fact that like, you know, there's study after study coming out that has just completely um contradictory information essentially. And one in particular, recently there was there's a bit of a scandal with the NIH, uh National Institutes of Health. 
um, in the U.S. They sponsored this like massive study, a uh, hundred million dollar study um, on the potential benefits of alcohol consumption, uh, specifically on heart health. Um, but the thing is, the scandal that broke was actually that uh, over 67 million of that 100 million actually came from the alcohol industry. Five major kind of companies, alcohol companies had, had been sponsoring it. And it's like everybody's just kind of like turning around and going, wait a second, you're doing a study on the benefits of alcohol that is being sponsored by the alcohol industry. Over two thirds of the funding is coming from the alcohol industry. It's like, how can you call that impartial or anything? And apparently there was a, a review and um, the reviewers kind of looked into it and said, well, there wasn't any actual kind of you know, shady business going on, except that there was frequent discussion between the researchers and the uh, the alcohol industry, and they were telling them, kind of, you know, nudging them in the directions of, of how to do the study to make it have kind of um, more beneficial uh, results to show that uh, alcohol is actually beneficial. So I'm I'm kind of calling BS on a lot of the studies that are out there. I mean, half the time the studies are just observational studies anyway, where they're just kind of like, you know, they do food frequency questionnaires, look at what the person's been eating, and then correlate that with diseases and see what diseases showed up and what didn't. And they say, oh, look, people who drank more red wine were less likely to have, you know, foot fungus. Therefore, <laughs> red wine gets rid of foot fungus. And it's like, no, you can't make those kinds of, uh, you know, observational studies can't, you can't draw causal conclusions from observational studies. So, so much, but I mean, they get the headline, right? So it's like, oh, red wine cures uh, foot fungus. So everybody starts drinking more red wine because they hate f foot fungus. So it's just, you know, well, it's a, sorry, go ahead. That's not really a surprise that the alcohol companies or big booze, <laughs> big booze, we should call it, uh, funds a lot of these studies. I mean, that happens not just uh, regarding alcohol, but food, medicines, yeah, things like that. I mean, they all are biased and fraudulent in some manner. I'd say most of them, maybe yeah. not all, but so that's not very surprising to me. Yeah. Well, and also you were talking about Doug with this funding. It's not like alcohol use is going down in any sort of significant way. Mm -hmm. So I got an article from uh, USA Today. It seems to be the newspaper I look at each week when we are about to do a show, and it's without fail. There's something interesting in there that just gives you some stats. So it's uh, the the title of the article is "Alcohol Use and Its Risk Growing Around the Globe." And so they, they talked about uh, just in the past 27 years, the total volume of alcohol people consumed globally each year increased by 70%. Wow, really? From, yes. From 500 or 5.5 billion gallons in 1990 to 9.4 billion gallons in 2017. And what? so... Uh, <laughs> What do they attribute that to? Like, is that because of population um, growth or? Maybe. It just says as of 2017, the most recent year for which statistics are avail available, the increase equates to about 1.7 gallons of pure alcohol per year per, per adult. <laughs> that means uh, an average adult drinks about one drink a day, whether it's a 12 ounce glass of beer, five ounces of wine, or one and one half ounces of distilled spirits. Well, um, I mean, given, I, I can't say I'm surprised given the state of the world that people are drinking more. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it says crazy. also the estimates also suggest that by 2030, half of the world's adults will drink and almost a quarter, 23%, will binge drink at least once a month. Hmm. Oh, that's crazy. And it's not a public health crisis? <laughs> <laughs> like the measles? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <sighs> well, yeah. they do have some stats about death in here. The World Health Organization, which we tend to rip on a lot in this show, but uh, they talk about how... Uh, more than 3 million people died as a result of harmful use of alcohol in 2016. So um, 
you know, it's, and it also said, uh, based on our data, the who's aim of reducing the harmful use of alcohol by just 10% by 2025 will not be reached. <laughs> so they're, that they're not going to reach that goal. Uh, Instead, alcohol use will remain one of the leading risk factors for the burden of disease for the foreseeable future. According to the study, it is linked to more than 200 diseases. Wow. A a rather egalitarian (laughs) stance on alcoholism. (laughs) Everything else was such gusto. (laughs) We have to declare war on cigarettes, so we have to declare war on anti-vaxxers yeah <laughs> yeah a million alcohol or people who drink die each year and they're just like yeah well you know you can't win them all we can do about it <laughs> <laughs> nothing we can do about it people are gonna drink it's not like we're the world health organization or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's true but again it's a huge money maker right i mean uh, bars restaurants i mean the wine industry you know what i mean and uh like you were saying doug like oh the heart health benefits i mean i can't tell you how many winos i know that are like i just drink a bottle a night it's good for me it's such bs too it's like that sorry go ahead people seriously underestimate the amount that they drink if they are a drinker not just an alcoholic but people who just drink socially but technically one drink equals no more than 0.6 ounces of pure alcohol or 12 ounces of beer or five ounces of wine and moderate consumption is considered up to one drink a day for women and up to two drinks a day for men i consider that a lot i do too (laughs) Yeah, binge drinking is five or more drinks for men and four or more drinks for women. And it has to happen on the same occasion. And then heavy alcohol use is binge drinking on five or more days. In a month. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's like to me, even that moderate drinking, like you were saying, Tiff, sounds like a lot. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. for uh, for me personally to drink two drinks a day, like that's a lot. I don't know. Maybe when I was younger, I don't even think when I was younger, I was ever drinking at the, like every day. You know, I wasn't yeah. the kind of person who would come home and have a beer or something like that. I mean, I guess it's just different lifestyle or something, but that, that still seems like a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe we should go to our first video clip. Um, where it's kind of talking about the science behind the drinking, what actually happens in your body when you imbibe alcohol. It tells us all about how the evil spirits take possession of your body. (laughs) Been there. (laughs) Ah, alcohol. It's known to make people all around the world feel a little more outgoing at dinners and dance parties. But the inside of your body sees alcohol as a poison, and it tries to get rid of it ASAP. Whatever your body can't process right away can end up in your brain, which affects how your cells interact with each other and causes all of those things that we associate with drunkenness. So it's totally fine to have a beer or two with your drinking-aged friends, but consistently drinking way too much alcohol can get dangerous in the long run. When you take a sip of an alcoholic beverage, the toxic stuff it contains, ethanol, also known as ethyl alcohol, is absorbed into your bloodstream through your stomach lining or small intestine. Your liver is responsible for filtering out this ethanol and breaking it down, using enzymes and other peptides so your body can safely get rid of it. First, it's converted into acetaldehyde, which is toxic too, and probably a big reason for those nasty hangovers. Then another enzyme turns acetaldehyde into acetate, which is harmless and eventually excreted in urine. And your liver does its best to get rid of all the ethanol you're putting in your body, but if you keep refilling that wine glass, it has trouble keeping up. So any excess ethanol circulates in your bloodstream and eventually reaches your brain. Now, usually foreign substances like bacteria and toxins are kept out of your brain thanks to the blood-brain barrier, basically a filter made of specialized cells and proteins. But it's actually pretty easy for ethanol to get in because it's attracted to fats so it can pass through those fatty cell membranes. And once alcohol reaches the brain, it starts to mess with the signaling between neurons, aka brain cells. The brain uses these chemicals called neurotransmitters to send messages between cells. The two most important ones are gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA, 
and glutamate. GABA binds to specialized receptor proteins and causes neurons to send fewer signals, so scientists say it's an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Glutamate, on the other hand, binds to receptors and causes neurons to send more signals, so it's an excitatory neurotransmitter. Ethanol interferes with this signaling by binding to both of these receptors and changing the messages the neurons receive. Specifically, ethanol enhances GABA signaling and reduces glutamate signaling, which means there's more inhibitory signaling and slower brain activity overall. That's why alcohol is considered a depressant. And its effects on different brain regions can cause different symptoms of drunkenness. For example, alcohol reduces activity in the cerebellum, which is responsible for motor coordination, causing all of that stumbling. It also suppresses the areas of the brain responsible for self-control and social inhibition, which makes us more outgoing, emotional, and prone to risky decisions. These effects go away as your body continues to process the ethanol, and as far as we know, there aren't any serious risks to moderate alcohol consumption, but ethanol is a toxin. So if you keep downing drink after drink in a short period of time, you can get alcohol poisoning, basically a shutdown of the medulla, which is the brain region that manages vital life support functions like breathing and heart rate. And there are long-term dangers linked with excessive amounts of alcohol consumption. You can get liver cirrhosis, or seriously scar your liver tissue because it gets damaged and doesn't work as well trying to process so much toxin for so long. Scientists also think a lot of ethanol in your bloodstream can put stress on other tissues in your body too, leading to inflammation, interfering with normal hormone levels, and making it harder for your cells to repair their DNA, all of which can increase the risk of developing certain cancers. And even though alcohol doesn't kill brain cells, too much alcohol can also have long-term effects on the brain. There's some evidence that consistently drinking alcohol as a young teenager can impact the growth and maintenance of connections between neurons, sometimes leading to learning and memory problems. Alcoholism is a physical dependence on alcohol, characterized by cravings for booze and the inability to stop drinking once you've started. Scientists also think too much ethanol in the bloodstream over a long period of time could prevent our intestines from properly absorbing thiamine, or or vitamin B1, and make it harder for our livers to store and use it too. A thiamine deficiency can lead to Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which is associated with the damage or shrinkage of several brain regions and causes a lot of problems in movement, memory, and vision. So a lot of really serious, unpleasant stuff. Alcohol has a lot of effects on the human body, and because it's a toxin, drinking too much can lead to some serious health concerns. But in moderation, around one or two drinks per day, it's considered to be fairly safe. So drink responsibly, friends. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow, brought to you by our patrons on Patreon. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's an interesting video, um, and I chose it because it did have kind of a good explanation for kind of the physiology of what goes on there. But one thing that I did kind of object to is that he, several times in the video, he's like, there's nothing saying that moderate drinking isn't, is harmful at all. We don't have any evidence that, you know, moderate drinking is, is bad for you. I, I, from the reading that we were doing before the show here, I think that that's just bunk. I think that mm -hmm. even, even moderate alcohol consumption still has a negative effect. There was one thing where they did, they had, there was a BBC, um, special that looked at um, alcohol drinking. I don't remember off the top of my head what it was called, but they actually did this thing where they took two identical twin brothers and they fed them 21 units of alcohol. So that was like the explanation you gave before, Tiff, of the like 0.6 ounces is like one mm -hmm. unit. And they had one uh, brother drink the, uh, the 21 units in one night and the other one had three drinks per day over the course of one week. And they continued the experiment for four weeks. So the one guy was drinking like one night of the week where he was binge drinking all 21 units and the other one, it's, they spread it out. And then they did medical tests on them to see what kind of happened to them. And they discovered that the moderate drinking was actually still quite harmful, even though there was more dramatic rise in the different tests that they did in the binge drinker. The moderate drinker still had the same kind of effects happening. It just wasn't as pronounced. Um, what was it that... Uh, Liver stiffness increased by about 25% for both the binge drinker and the moderate drinker. So same amount of liver stiffness. And that's like basically inflammation that can lead to um, cirrhosis. Um, and they also measured five different inflammatory markers and found that it rose in both the brothers, but that the binge drinker, it rose more. So the whole thing about, oh yeah, but moderate drinking is okay. I don't know. I don't know. I think you're still, and you know, not to be some kind of like moral police or something and wag your finger and say, no, 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 but drinking is bad. It's like, you no, know, like objectively, there is negative stuff going on here. Now, whether you want to take that on board and choose not to drink, I mean, that's up to you. But um, mm -hmm. I think putting it like continually putting out there, oh, moderate drinking is okay. I mean, 
it wouldn't surprise me if that's just basically coming from the alcohol companies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, like we were saying before too, it's, it's their, their definition of moderate drinking is kind of not what I would consider moderate drinking anyway. It seems like it's still quite heavy like two drinks a day for men, one for women. Like if you're drinking every day, that's still considered moderate. I, I don't know. I kind of feel like that's not moderate I don't anymore. Think it's moderate at all. I think that's a daily habit that yeah. needs to be. A yeah. I mean, well, you think about too the legalization of it since 1933 and then the, promotion of it through advertising as Tiffany was saying movies and it's socially acceptable and you know you go out with your coworkers or your friends but then also thinking about the implications legally of like drunk driving mm -hmm. and um let alone the deaths that happen but all of the money that is being made by police officers and courts and you know quote unquote rehab programs and i mean i know it's two to three thousand dollars if you get a drunk driving uh charge mm -hmm. and you have to go to a support group and classes and you know people are repeat offenders of drunk driving it's not like they uh they quit, you know what I mean? And deal mm. with it. But there's just so much money to be made off of it. It, it on both uh, ends. Of I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, certainly there's, there's money to be made on drinking for sure, but I don't know that. I don't know if we can implicate the police in like a cons grand conspiracy to, you know, keep. Oh no, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't think that. I just think oh. that, um, it's not changing behavior is my, point. Uh, I like I, I have, met plenty of people who had a DUI driving under the influence as they call it in the U S and still drink. It wasn't yeah. like, uh, it wasn't like they, they learned their lesson quote unquote, you know what I mean? And I mean, you do see ads, for, you know, don't drink and drive and call your taxi, call your mom, whatever it is. But, yeah. you know, especially in rural areas, like people take that risk, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll use uh, Utah as a really good example. So for our listeners that don't know, uh, Utah being a predominantly Mormon state has a low alcohol content, 3.2 two is what the alcohol and beer is allowed everything else you have to buy at a state liquor store and if you drink two beers you are you could be drunk driving mm -hmm. you know what i mean and so you know they did this whole kind of thing where they were trying to cut down on the use of people drinking but they dro dropped the limit and so people are still getting pulled over they're still getting in trouble and you know Budweiser just recently came out and they've been making their Budweiser with this 3.2 they're it's the only state in the United States that has that law so mm -hmm. they're like well we don't want to be doing this anymore this is not worth it for us you know mm -hmm. so I don't know I just think that the, it's it's a vicious cycle my point being and that you know i really don't think the um trouble that people are getting in is dissuading them from mm. risky behavior or consequences of I said think it's risky because behavior. they think it's so fun yeah <laughs> um, and that's the highlight of a lot of people's weeks really is to go out to a bar or something and get drunk with their friends and tell funny stories about how drunk they were and laugh at their friends who were slurring falling down it's like a funny thing to people and maybe they don't have anything else to do that's better than going out and getting drunk i don't know but another thing that just came to me is like one thing i noticed just by watching a lot of movies it seems like every time there's a scene in a movie where the characters are in a bar there's a bar fight <laughs> <laughs> So next time you watch a movie where they're drinking in a bar, notice how many times it erupts into a bar fight. That'll be homework for you well, guys. Yeah. And for That's just the way bars are, mm -hmm. Tiff. I guess so. <laughs> well, and, and like the, uh, the picture behind you, Doug, I mean, you want to oh, give the, us a little description about the booze about cruise that I'm on? <laughs> this is a booze cruise. I'm on a, I'm, I'm reporting live from a, a booze cruise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they look like they're having like the greatest time ever. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's great here. Lots of lots of risky behavior and not very wise choices. <laughs> Definitely. 
Yes. Yeah. Well, should we go to our second? Well, actually, I don't know if we should go to our second clip yet because we haven't really talked about alcoholism that much, which is what the the, the second clip kind of deals with, because that to me seems to be the the biggest kind of issue with uh, with alcohol is that mm-hmm. it is so potentially addictive, and it does seem like. It is more so for some people than for others. Like personally, I don't think I was ever at risk of becoming an alcoholic. I never enjoyed it that much. Like I liked drinking when I was younger and stuff and I would go out and party with friends and all that kind of stuff. But I was never the kind of person who would want to do that every day. You know, I was never the kind of person who would like be like, I, I need, I, you know, oh, I need a drink. I need a drink to unwind. It was kind of like, you know, mm-hmm. I would, I would you know, have drinks with friends or something like that. But, but some people aren't like that. Like some people are, they do get a, an incredible sense of reward from drinking alcohol to the point where they can't, they kind of need to have another one and then another one and then another one and they can't really stop. And they do that Mm -hmm. regularly. So I know that there are genetic differences that they've studied in this. And there's, there certainly are types of people who are much more prone to alcoholism than others. Um, But. Well, there's something that um, people describe as an alcoholic personality. Mm -hmm. And I think to a greater or lesser extent, Pretty much everybody has these kind of traits, but they say that alcoholic personalities have a lot of self-pity, guilt, shame. They're impulsive. They can be anxious. Um, They can be underachievers, yet perfectionists at the same time. Um, Another thing is that they blame other people for their problems, and they have a low tolerance for negativity. Yeah. Um, they have a, a dependence. They need other people to look after them. They can't deal with frustration and they have this sense of injustice. So the question is like in the, um, the resource that I got this from, they said that this is the result and not the cause of alcoholism. But I think that some people would argue with that mm-hmm. because there's in this term alcoholic personality that's been thrown around, whether it's, you know, something that's passed on through genes or something you learn from having alcoholic parents or being around, you know, other alcoholic family members. So who knows, but <clears throat> there, there seems to be these traits that these alcoholics have. Mm-hmm. And of course there are certain stages of alcoholism. Like you can start where maybe you just, you know, going out on the weekends and partying with your friends. But uh, they say that the early stage of alcoholism is when drinking no longer becomes just a social thing. Mm-hmm. You start to do it outside of parties or bars or social situations and you start drinking to make yourself feel better about something whether it's some kind of childhood trauma or some difficulties in your life and in this early stage you start to have increased tolerance and you can drink and not appear to be drunk like nobody would be able to tell that you were drunk Mm. and deny that you're an alcoholic And then there's a middle stage where the person seems more stereotypically drunk and they start having drinking buddies, not just drinking by themselves or drinking on the weekends, but they don't have any joy really in drinking. I guess the funness kind of goes out of it and they can't control their cravings. They start to have blackouts, some health problems. They might get into a little trouble at work or at home. And then the final stage where your alcoholism has become so bad where you're either going to die or you're just going to have to stop drinking. And Mm. you start to have serious health issues, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, mental problems. Um, Your relationships are totally messed up and drinking is the sole focus of your life. And another interesting thing that they mentioned was some of these later stage alcoholics have this sense of impending doom and constant anxiety, which I've noticed in a couple of people who I would consider to be in the final stages of alcoholism. Mm. It's like uh, they're always nervous, like something bad's going to happen. They're scared of 
whatever it is, who knows what it is, but they're just kind of anxious. And they say that also during this stage that there's a drop in tolerance and, you know, they can't actually handle as much alcoholism with as much or as much alcohol with as much finesse as they used to be able to. Mm. And, uh, they have longer blackouts and either they stop at this point or they die eventually. Right. Well, yeah. And the thing is with uh, alcoholism too, is that it kind of seems like they still don't really know how to treat it. I mean, there's lots mm -hmm. of different experimental treatments and things like that. And they, you know, there's Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and those sorts of things. And, you know, I, you know, I'm not trying to disparage any of the, of the techniques or anything like that, but it seems like uh, there's still a lot to be done on figuring out how to actually deal with this, like how, to, how people can, can kind of get better. I mean, obviously there's a lot of kind of psychological aspects to this, you know, you, you have to kind of look into how a person kind of got there in the first place. Um, I think that that needs to be part of the treatment. Um, but just as a clumsy segue into our other clip here, this one kind of deals with a, a pharmaceutical intervention called naltrexone. And there's a certain method called the Sinclair method um, that apparently is, is kind of working wonders for getting people, well, to, to, like to stop alcohol, alcoholism, I guess, I guess is the way that you would say it. So maybe we can play that, that second clip right now. Approach. One problem with this study trying to manage heavy drinking with naltrexone is that the patients were encouraged to be abstinent while on the naltrexone. As you know, it doesn't work with abstinence. It cannot work with abstinence. Here is Roy Escapa, the author of the ambitiously titled book, The Cure for Alcoholism, in which he lays out in detail a treatment for alcoholism called the Sinclair Method and explains the science behind it. However, Dr. David Sinclair, the person who this method has been credited to, refers to it as pharmacological extinction. The method is simple. You take 50 milligrams of the opioid receptor antagonist naltrexone one hour before drinking, and you do this every single time you expect to drink. But you only take it on the days that you do drink. The medicine itself is not curative. You have to take the medication one hour before drinking. As you'd expect from an opioid antagonist, naltrexone has been used to try and treat opiate addiction. As this paper way back from 1978 found, there wasn't too much benefit compared to placebo for those who took naltrexone with the aim to help entirely prevent them from using heroin and reducing cravings. However, there was an improvement in the people who disobeyed the instructions. Those that went ahead and did the heroin while they were on the medication, their cravings started to decrease. Thanks to the medication, shooting up is like ringing Pavlov's bell, but no food comes. And this brings the behavior of seeking and wanting drugs closer to extinction. Amazingly, this pharmacological extinction method has been shown to be very effective with alcohol. Here is a graph from Dr. David Sinclair in the Roy Escapa book, showing that in rats, after only five extinction sessions, that is a naltrexone plus alcohol session, the rats were already drinking 10 times less than they normally did. The first double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial on naltrexone and alcohol from 1992 found that naltrexone was safe and effective, with the primary benefits being seen in patients who drank alcohol while on the medication. This clinical trial found that naltrexone did not reduce the frequency of drinking, but it significantly reduced the amount that the people drank. According to the earlier mentioned book, 90 out of 91 clinical trials found that opioid antagonists like naltrexone are effective if extinction is possible. That is, if a substance-addicted person can use the opioid antagonist medication and use the substance. When extinction was not possible, as in the patients had to be abstinent from drugs or alcohol while taking the medication, 36 out of 37 trials found no significant benefits from the medication. According to the book, it takes on average three to four months for an alcoholic or alcohol-dependent person to lose their dependence on alcohol through this pharmacological extinction method. According to David Sinclair, the success rate in his clinics in Finland is about 78%, and 
and clinics in Florida had a success rate of 85%. If you're curious about what the experience of drinking while on naltrexone is like, a close friend of mine from the States said, I found that I've been much more picky with how things taste, so I'll just waste entire drinks because they don't taste good. And in an email she said, it just slowly makes drinking less and less interesting. By the way, she's not an alcoholic or alcohol dependent, but sometimes simply drinks more than she intends. So what is it like for an actual alcoholic? I'm, I'm waiting, I keep waiting for the, for the feeling, and it, it's not coming. When you get that first drink, that, like, oh, that felt good. And then it's like, give me more. But when you don't get it, what is the point? The Sinclair method could be a very promising route for people who are alcohol dependent, considering the alternative is to essentially go cold turkey, detox, and go on to wrestle with their cravings for who knows how long. Considering alcohol use is the seventh leading risk for death and disease globally, I'm hoping this video brings more awareness to the scientifically sound, but relatively unknown Sinclair method. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah. I think um, <clears throat> potentially, judging by the way it, it kind of works, it seems like that could be used. I mean, they mentioned opioid use as well, <clears throat> but to kind of have this uh, this method for kind of breaking all addictive cycles. Like, I wonder if you could even use that for like cell phone addiction or like video game addiction or something along those lines, you know? Maybe. I mean, if you're not getting the opioid hit from all your addictive behaviors it's just kind of like well this isn't really as fun anymore i don't really know why i'm doing this i wonder how expensive it is and mm. if the people who are suffering from some kind of substance addiction would be responsible enough to time their use to one hour after taking it because i yeah. know people who Wake all day long. Are they ever going to have a time? Maybe they could do it when they first wake up. Yeah. That'll probably work. Well, I think like with anything, it, it's the person has to want to quit. Like that's really kind of the first, the first requirement is that, you know, it's a, if the person is self-administering this drug, but they don't want to quit, then it's like, well, he, of course they're going to like forget or whatever the case may be. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I think really the the motivation still has to come from the individual that they want to get better. They recognize that they have a problem and that they need to get better, um, mm -hmm. because otherwise it's it's going to be as useless as any other useless intervention. <laughs> now, I guess the three to four months isn't a lot to ask if you're really dedicated to stopping drinking, because it probably didn't take you three to four months to become a raging alcoholic. So right. it's worth a shot. Yeah. The one the one issue might be um that if the underlying kind of psychological like what they what got them there in the first place if that underlying problem isn't really addressed or taken care of then even getting off of alcohol and getting to a point where you don't crave it anymore I I wonder if it would just you know some other coping mechanism would just like move in and take mm -hmm. over in some way. Yeah. So you probably have to have something to replace your drinking, some other activity that will, I don't know, fulfill you or give you some kind of meaning in life yeah. to replace your drinking. Yeah. Something constructive. Going out and being yeah. a good person. <laughs> One moment at a time. Yeah. Well, and for, for the research, too, we also looked into other types of substances that are being used for addiction. One of them is LSD. Mm -hmm. So using um, small micro doses of LSD to, again, what you were talking about, like deal with those deeper implications. Now I'm not encouraging it or saying that it works, but it's just interesting that there are studies being done on using it. Uh, Neuroscientists at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology um, started looking into how LSD was a possible treatment for alcoholism. And um, 
It says, although most people associate the psychedelic drug with the hippie counterculture of the 1960s, psychiatrists have been studying the use of LSD as an aid to psychological therapy before it was outlawed in the United States. And so uh, if if listeners are interested in reading the article, it's called Alcoholism, LSD is a Possible Viable Treatment, researchers say, and... uh, you know, not that I have had any experience with alcoholism and didn't need to use LSD to get off of it. Um, you know, we're starting to see more and more of these types of articles where these mm-hmm. types of substances are being used to address probably more core, deeper issues. Mm-hmm. Like Tiffany was saying, you know, anxiety, self-loathing, low self-esteem, and, uh, you know, I mean, maybe even one treatment, according to this article, just one treatment under supervised clinical situation can help people uh, deal with those more core issues that are leading them back to drinking as a coping mechanism. Yeah. There's also, <clears throat> I know they've been using um, psilocybin as well, like the extract from magic mushrooms, which is another hallucinogen. Um and ecstasy as well, right? MDMA? Yeah, MDMA, yeah. Yeah, um, which they've been having pretty amazing results from what I've been reading about um, with uh, PTSD, um, treating PTSD mm-hmm. with uh, MDMA therapy. And um, it was interesting, in one of the articles we were reading, the uh, the researcher was wanting to use MDMA therapy for alcoholism. And he said, alcoholics all have PTSD. So it just, it makes sense that if they're having success with PTSD, that it might actually be quite helpful with uh, alcoholism as well. Yeah, they were saying that patients in this this study about, um, you were talking about MDMA, uh, who on average consumed an equivalent of five bottles of wine a day, oh. which is that's a lot. Yeah. Um, I was sent to detox and receive two drug free therapy sessions, and then they will be given a high dose of ecstasy and undergo all day counseling session, which will comprise of meditation and one to one talks with a therapist. Mm. So, you know, again, that same idea of using that treatment to kind of break that barrier mm. there and address deeper issues. Yeah, I think they said something about how it makes the alcoholic more empathetic towards other people and also themselves more understanding and it gives them a sense of like uh, emotional security so they can actually engage better in therapy and the therapy can be more effective. So it's not as if the ecstasy is actually curing their alcoholism. It's just uh, making them more open to treatment modalities that can help cure their alcoholism. Yeah. And I think that's the case with, uh, you know, the LSD and the psilocybin and stuff like that as well. It's not that it's actually like some kind of wonder drug that, you know, people are using it for recreational purposes, but it also has the side effect of curing alcoholism. I think it's more that um, there are, it puts people into like different psychological states that can be conducive to kind of working through issues one of those being mm-hmm. alcoholism. At least that's the impression that I get. I don't think it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not like naltrexone or something like that or that kind of therapy. Um, it's more like assisting in kind of deep psychology. That's the impression. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, things have really changed when these are becoming the go-to research topics for dealing with alcoholism, mm-hmm. you know, that, and because we've all heard of Alcoholics Anonymous and, um, you know, they, they don't have a super high su- success rate, mainly for like young adults or even teenagers, because, you know, you can go to meetings and whatnot, but for especially younger adults, listening to someone lose everything they own and have their life be ruined is not really a reality for a lot of young people. They can't really empathize with that. So, you know, just finding a workaround. I mean, I'm not saying that Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't work for some people, but it seems like with what we're dealing with, more extreme measures are required at this point. Well, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous actually wanted to 
basically dose people with LSD at the meetings, if I if I remember correctly. Yeah, so, I remember reading too. So yeah, I mean, he apparently thought it was useful as well. I think that these alternative treatments probably have a lot of promise. I don't know how widely they'll be accepted or used, but I think they should be as much as possible. But I think that probably one of the benefits of one of these treatments over uh, something like Alcoholics Anonymous is, I think that AA requires a lot of self-work and a lot of self-reflection and strength of character and to be able to take feedback that is not good at the time and to be able to look at yourself truthfully and maybe not everybody is able to do that. So if they can use some of these drugs and get themselves to a place maybe close to that where they can do it or maybe just, I don't know, do something to the best of whatever their cognitive ability is, even if you might not be able to go as deep. Mm. Uh, somebody is uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous and who has been successful with that. I mean, maybe not everybody is capable of that type mm. of self-reflection. Right. I don't know. Well, another interesting kind of non-alcohol or non-drug intervention is uh, stimulating the vagus nerve. So meditation, uh, breathing exercises. And um, there's an article on SOT called a new study shows vagus nerve stimulation may help addicts overcome addiction. And yes, we're, we're talking about alcohol here, but those personality traits like Tiffany shared, those addictive, and it can be anything. It could be gambling, porn, video games, but um, how learning how to stimulate the vagus nerve with breathing um, to s slow down your emotional response system and raise your vagal tone, right? So uh, raising the vagal tone helps uh, create positive emotions, uh, psychological homostasis, and can start to create an upward spiral of well-being. Um, they say in the article, low vagal tone conversely is associated with free-floating anxiety, stress, inflammation, and depression, and can create a downward spiral of well-being. So, you know, this is obviously much harder to do than some other kind of quick intervention, but, but just having an intervention that is available and free, essentially. And can be used in tandem with other interventions. I mean, you don't have to do any of these things alone. Mm. Yep. So, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's probably a lot we didn't cover here in this show, but just as kind of a, a primer for our listeners, mm -hmm. you know, just, you know, s try not to buy into the whole thing that, that uh, moderate consumption is okay, it's good for your health, you know, binge mm -hmm. drinking is up bad somewhere in the middle I don't know but you know just getting the information out there for people that may be interested and even a lot of us I'm speaking from experience who struggle with family members that are alcoholics and how to deal with that how to be of service if you can and offer suggestions that might help that's probably a whole other show <laughs> yes that is a whole other show indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, for our listeners that may be interested in the information about the vagus nerve, you can try EE, Aerolis, uh, breath reduction, breath, breath, stress reduction through breathing <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Let me take a breath here. Breath reduction. <laughs> Reduce your breathing. Yeah. You're breathing too much. <laughs> You know, and um, support, you know, as Tiffany was saying, like being willing to receive feedback, you know, most people that have an alcoholic in their life, they'll tell them straightforward, you know, mm. <laughs> or trust <them. laughs> <laughs> So on that note, we have something a little bit lighter, Zoya's pet health segment. So yes. we will go to Zoya's pet health segment.
Hello and welcome to the pet health segment of the Objective Health Show. This time we are going to talk about dogs' anxiety during car rides. What you can do in order to make this trip a little bit easier for your furry companion. And don't forget to wait until the end to watch a funny video. Have a great day and goodbye. Good afternoon. This is Dr. Bobby Cothran, lead veterinarian with Aspen Grove Veterinary Care, coming to you from Fort Collins, Colorado. And today we're going to talk about anxious car rides for dogs and what we can do about that, of course. It's a pretty common thing that a lot of my clients come to the exam room asking what we can do to make things a little bit easier for their dog because they get really anxious in the car. The symptoms usually range from just being super excited to being really, really anxious, panting a lot, drooling, even can see dogs that vomit because they get so worked up in scenarios like this. So there's several things we talk about to help that out. The first one is to start early. When I mean start early is as a puppy, if you can, really start to make them more used to car rides. Taking short little trips so that the motion is not too disturbing to them. Making sure that they get to go to fun places is a whole lot better than only taking your dog to the vet clinic. When they know that they're gonna go and get shots every single time, they might get a little more anxious because they're never going anywhere fun. So start taking short trips to the park, maybe even down to you know the post office, doing little things like that can make it a little bit more fun for them. Treating them in the car is never a bad idea. If they're really food motivated, you can get them to be a lot more happy by treating them really heavily during the car ride. So it becomes again a much more fun experience. In those particular cases where you feel like they're just out of control, they're bouncing around everywhere, you have to make things of course safe for you as you're driving, but you have also can make it still fun. So if they are being ridden in a crate, you can treat them through that crate and give them those things that might make them happy. Toys and treats are always an important thing. If this becomes such a big problem that anxiety is just uncontrollable or you're needing to do something to take a long trip, there is some anxiety relief meds that are out there. We of course have the true pharmaceutical grade type of anxiety relief. We can grab onto the Valiums and the Xanaxes of the world and really provide some sedation, but there's some really nice other products that are a little bit more homeopathic in their remedy to help calm the body down. Those can include lots of little treats that, in, that have chamomile, and tryptophan, just generally calming medications. There's even some pheromone type of products that are now available that are calming for dogs. Dogs have a very sensitive nose and these pheromones can absolutely create an active relief of anxiety in their brain through their nose. And you can spray your car as well as the crate if they're using that to help relieve some of those symptoms. So the big picture to keep in mind is that there's a lot of things you can do to make that trip a little bit easier and that's always available to you. For more information or details on this subject, please visit our blog on our website. Squirrel. Yeah, it's kind of a metaphor for life, you know. <laughs> and I kind well, of, he, kept he kept trying, but I like that it also ended with him never accomplishing the goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Zoya, for that helpful information about dog anxiety in cars and the squirrel that never attained its goal. <laughs> Well, thank you all for listening and um, watching and joining us today. Um, please subscribe and like Objective Health, and uh, we will be back again with another topic. See ya. Have a wonderful day. Bye, everybody. <laughs>